make a uh, a correction this is uh, this presentation is part of uh, the Antiochian House of Studies that is uh, given as a residency program and in this residency program we deal with the, uh, the uh, this particular topic that we have uh, for today would be what was covered in Doctrine 1 dealing with the way of uh, spiritual knowledge and intuitive apprehension of the spiritual knowledge. In this regard, we are going to talk about uh, things that uh, are related to uh, the difference between the two approaches the rational knowledge and the intuitive uh, knowledge, which is uh, basically the spiritual knowledge. And we'll move from there to have certain uh, parts of our understanding of uh, what rational knowledge is all about and how it is uh, presented in the history of uh, some philosophical thought and then we will continue to, to see the, uh, the alternative of how the spiritual knowledge is uh, presented in the church and uh, other things that are connected with it. So if you bear, uh, you know, be patient with me, I would like to start, you know, those uh, lectures, those presentations and uh, it will be followed one after the other. We can take maybe uh, a break uh, moving from one section to the another. What I wanted to say is the following. We are in the beginning of uh, a new church year. It comes to us as an invitation to some pastoral recommendations that we need to establish as we read in the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. It is there we are told to be watchful, to stand firm in our faith and be courageous and be strong. We are called not to compromise when it comes to the scope of our faith and we do not give up nor sacrifice any of that particular faith. Everything is uh, something that pertains to our growth and uh, it is based on those who have struggled in the life of the church and we understand that whatever struggle we do it is supported by the power of the Holy Spirit because we are participants in the Holy Spirit through our struggle and salvation is given to us from God and we accept that as part of the essence of the Christian life, which is basically love. In this regard, we hear the words of St. Paul, let all that you do is done in love. We also understand, reminded by the words of St. Paul, that church membership requires that pastoral and practical love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if it, it says, if anyone has the love for the, that leads for our Lord Jesus Christ, if that is not something that is made nor practiced, let them be excommunicated. It is based on these resolutions that are connected with the matters of our faith, our life in Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone as we read in last Sunday's gospel, talking about the parable of the vineyard, that according to the teachings of St. Cyril of Alexandria, that our Lord Jesus Christ brought together the Jews and the nations as being one new nation after having been entered into the life of the church and become members of the body of Christ. It is from that point 
there is a bond of love and of faith. And that is what we talk about the new covenant, a new testament that brings all people and from all nations so that they may seek their membership and they may continue in the way of repentance, maintaining holiness, and to be productive in their life. It is therefore based on this love that we come during this residency program in the House of Studies, and we want to maintain and continue the faith that we have received to be careful in what we do in terms of our moral life and the way we conduct our own way of life with our children with and our families to be purified and cleansed soul and body so that they may participate in the work of this ministry and to be filled by the presence of our Lord to become the Church of Christ so that both those who are around us and those who are in the heavenly realm, the angels that will be in support of that ministry. We know that in every generation of the Christian church in the past 2000 years, those who love Christ are equipped and armed with the truth and with the virtues to defend the faith with patience and with the correct words. And those who are strong among us continue in that truth and in the purity of life. We are connected with Christ, not in an emotional or sentimental dimension. We want to remind ourselves the words of Jesus Christ. He who loves me will keep my commandments. The issue then is an issue of showing our obedience to Jesus Christ in every segment of our own life. And the summit of this love is to die for the faith, not in the sense that we seek the death by shedding our blood, but by controlling and putting under control the passions. This is what is regarded by the church fathers as the greatest struggle. And it is in this struggle that we control over our vices, everything that we may have from our fallen world. And at the same time, we continue to focus on the main priorities in our own life. We, in our own way of defining and determining things may look into things from the external. For instance, we may say that our priest has a good voice, or he is a theologian, or anything of that sort. <clears throat> we understand that this kind of knowledge, even though we may read thousands and hundreds and thousands of books in theology, we have to focus on where our heart is. If it is somewhere else, then reading all books and knowing that knowledge will not be suffice. We have to consider that we enter into the realm where Christ becomes the dominant in our own life. And in this regard, we take that trust that we have received from our faith. We always search for Christ in the heart, and that would be the one that leads us into our membership and participation in the life of the church in the fear, faith, and love of God. So what I wanted to uh, continue uh, in this presentation is to try to understand our own realities in the life of the given life that God has given us. We are in the world we may cherish things that are part of our rational knowledge, and we also have this call to seek spiritual knowledge. We wanted to see the kind of things 
that human beings may belong in this world. And I can see that at least we can distinguish three categories. The first category is the people of the world. We are talking about those who live in the world and those who enjoy and practice worldliness. They become attached, the people of the world become attached to the belongings of the world and they are tempted by its goodies. They enjoy the pleasures of the world and its pride is enjoyable as well. In the end, it becomes nothing but a mere illusion. The world reshapes a material face and substitutes the human identity with mere belongings. It creates an imbalance between what one really is and also what he or she possesses. The loss of belongings for the people of the world becomes a terrible experience. Sometimes it leads to suicide. And since the reason is this, that since our inward soul was forward and shaped through the material outward. Neither Dr. Nwan or Dr. Two. This is for the residency program. Friday will be for Dr. One. No, we're not talking about Dr. Two. We just finished from Dr. Two recently. Friday we will do Dr. One. The lectures will be on Doctrine One. Hey, Abuna, let, me, send, uh, let me, let me, uh, Abuna, let me let everybody know what's going on then. Th this lecture that Father Joseph is giving is a general lecture, lecture for the residency. Uh, some material will cover Doctrine One, some material will cover Doctrine Two, but it's a general lecture for the residency. Uh, and then the one on Friday will be specific for Doctrine One. Uh, after that, for those of you who are in Doctrine 2, for this semester, uh, we will have special uh, uh, session, Zoom sessions uh, for, for the material itself that we will set up with Father Joseph in the future, okay, in the near future. So, Abuna... Well, let, let me again clarify. You know, first, I was under the impression that we were doing the residency program and the choice of the program for the first year was spiritual knowledge versus, spirit, uh, versus rational knowledge. And we will continue with the rest of the residency program talking about uh, other things that are related to both one and two. We just finished with Doctrine Two recently. We submitted uh, and corrected and read all the papers. And now this coming Friday, we will talk about Doctrine One. Doctrine One will be the topic for this coming uh, Friday, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. And then later on uh, during the course of the year, we will continue with, with Doctrine Two concerning the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. So I wanted to make sure that what we are doing today will be uh, uh, covering uh, that uh, understanding uh, the spiritual knowledge versus the rational knowledge. It is indirectly connected with the methodology of Doctrine One, but that will be treated separately this coming Friday. Is that clear? Yes, thank you, Abuna. Please continue. Okay, so we, we will continue again talking about the uh, the, the, the human beings that belong to these three categories, and one is uh, uh, the, the categories of those who are in the world. And we said that uh, for those who experience uh, loss of belongings, they become terrible, have a terrible experience, since their inward soul is forward and shaped through the material outward. 
money in this regard in its abundance is the rampart of power, of arrogance, destruction of others, physical and ideological cancellation. They do not need other to acknowledge their existence. Their existence is based solely on power loss of money will trigger their own destruction. And fear of losing power explains their greediness, their tyranny, and ultimately their suicide. This is what we find today in our fallen secular society that experiences this category of those who are living in the world and for the world itself. On the other hand, as part of this presentation is to see what the people who are the intellectuals, the intellectual people in the world today. To them, knowledge is an extensive existence because they have put the world in their brains. Pleasures of the book, arts and varieties make them think they are invading the unknown and realizing themselves. They believe they have and they can change the world. Like the people of the world, they may have keenness and openness and enthusiasm, a footstep of a possible vision. It is in fact a passion. Also, we come to the understanding of those who are seeking the spiritual knowledge and we can refer to them as the people of heart and people of love. Basically, they are unchallenged. They despise much of what this world has to offer without boasting against others. Attachment without being sucked in What's and up? detachment without being arrogant. They yield away education and at attain the inexplicable. They can be the most educated, they can be rich and intellectual, but money, power, and education is not their depth their hearts have attained another depth, an irreproachable depth. They do not boast. People of love engage into a covenant. They do not have a monopoly of love and graces. They are not owners. The blessings transparently pass through them. Nakedness and poverty are their last resort up to him. Putting on the nakedness of Christ, they escape the foolishness of this world. They realize education is a power, but is not salvation. They do not despise the books. They become attached without being sucked in or absorbed detached without being boastful or critical, ignorant and the educated to study tools for service. They do not despise money. You can transform it to a means for consolation. Even power can be a tool of benevolence. All the heritage of this world is mere nothing in comparison with the residing love in the hearts. And it is in this regard, we begin to understand that spiritual life and spiritual knowledge is based on the spiritual growth and part of our pastoral life with all the challenges and the responses that we provide. We know that we are as people seeking the spiritual knowledge, we are involved in various church ministries. 
whether ordained or even non-ordained. We use that as channels to spiritual growth, totality of personhood dealing with that growth in terms of body, soul, and spirit. Life in Christ to those who are challenged and respond properly is a life as a way of life in Jesus Christ. The question that comes to our own challenge, how can we give birth to the religious identity of our spiritual beings? Church ministry is derived from the nature of faith itself. It is not derived from or debated theology, books and manuals, or from studies and researches undertaken by theologians. Basically, it is incarnational and phenomenological as well. God became man. He dwelled among us. He did not choose to send a series of commandments or just few chapters or verses like a new edition of the Ten Commandments or even the Quran or a book to be recited and to be read. He was born from a woman and was nurtured by her. The theological debate of the 14th century in Europe gave the impression to some that theology is reduced to the debates among orthodoxy and other faith and what is read and written in certain manuals. On the other hand, the Lord Jesus' concern is to generate the religious identity of the human person who is responsible of doing certain things in the world. The Lord did not limit his preaching ministry to give us simple lessons or parables. He became man. He is the divine reality by whose presence the fallen world takes a different position. The maker of heaven and earth provided this model of incarnational theology, which attempts to deliver the human person who is fallen in the deluge of sin. It is not true that the human person who is born under the condition of sin is doomed to die under its impact. Christ came to extend his mercy and compassion and to deliver humanity. Sin has no ultimate and or categorical spell over mankind. We are reminded in the book of Genesis that man is created in God's image and likeness. We have to be reminded of the fact especially these days. And when we talk about spiritual progress, that should mean to us that the human person who is born in sin does not completely eliminate nor lose his image and likeness. We are organically formed in his image and likeness, both in body, soul, and mind. God embraced our human nature. In his ministry, he called sinners into salvation. He was not defiled nor polluted by sinners. He said that he came for the sick and the imperfect in order to be healed and to be cleansed. God does not want us to be forever victims of the state of sin. We may continue to sin, however, the image of God is not completely eliminated or totally distorted. Its presence continues to be manifested, and that is why the church ministry gives us joy and hope, 
especially to sinners. We may be tempted, but never hopeless. God gives us his energy and grace to overcome sin only if we make the right choices and are led to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. God is mightier than sin. We can overcome sin by the saving powers of our Lord. Throughout his ministry, Jesus healed the sick, and those who were possessed by demons were restored by his saving and life-creating command. This brings us to the fact that faith is not an intellectual school of thought, nor is the pastor a simple teacher who only teaches and delivers lectures to his flock. Pastoral life and spiritual growth call for planting the faith in the lives of the human persons, not as simple, rational, and or intellectual convictions, which may become manifest in our debates and arguments as seen in the field of philosophy. To argue about faith does not cover all aspects of faith. Jesus Christ did not give the lessons about faith. He pointed out that faith is inherent in our being and existence as such. It is not limited or necessarily confined to thinking only. To think about faith reveals one aspect of it. The main concern is to deal with faith in many levels of life. In moments of joy, in moments of sadness, and in assuming various responsibilities. Matters of faith are revealed in human beings, for example, in motherhood. My mother or your mother do not give us lectures about faith. In the totality of life situation, they provide their flesh and bones their lives, their thoughts, their joy, and their sadness from the time they are empowered with their sacred obligations as mothers and assume all risk for the safety of their children. Driven by love, which is rendered freely and under no condition. This is how God grants us the opportunity to live. We do not receive that by reading a book or a manual, but by focusing on another book, the human person who transcends all written documents. In terms of our spiritual growth, our focus must be on the personal dimension of the family unit. We are led to discover the world through our family life, interacting with one another, whether in church as a whole or in our little church at our own homes, sharing moments of joy and pain. Faith is partnership, not a simple prescription. There is hierarchy in the family unit, a head for harmony and order who knows how to read his family well. The church sees a family and seeks the faithful believers. They must work together to achieve certain goals and to provide responses to the challenges they face in life. All right, Abuna, uh, if I may, uh, uh, with your permission for just a minute, I need to say something uh, to everyone in the class. There are people that are joining us. So welcome to those of you who just joined us now. I understand that the class was scheduled uh, for 2.30. Uh, please uh, listen to me carefully because I'm going to clarify some of the things that uh, are confusing you. 
uh, Father Joseph's schedule uh, uh, demanded that we begin half an hour early because of his uh, schedule in Michigan at his church and uh, with his assistant. This uh, session is being recorded. The entire session is being recorded, and so it will be available for all of you uh, to watch at your own convenience, so you will not have missed anything. Those of you who came late, you will not have missed any, say, anything, so don't worry. Uh, Father Joseph is now doing what he has always done at the village during this time, which is in, an int his introductory lectures for the residency, which will encompass material for both Doctrine 1 and Doctrine 2 in general. I understand that the, the course, the, the, your description says Doctrine 2. I understand that. However, this is what Father Joseph has always done with his lectures, and uh, he will continue uh, throughout the session. The session will be uh, going on until 5 p.m. Eastern time. I understand also that some of you have other classes to go to. Don't worry. I already mentioned to you that the session will be recorded and that you can come back and watch it at your own convenience and you will not miss anything. For material that is a specific to Doctrine 1, which is scheduled for spring and we were asked to do the lectures now, uh, that session is going to be on Friday at 2 p.m. and I will, uh, you, I will send you the link uh, for the Zoom meeting, uh, which will be on the residency bulletin board. Uh, for classes specific to Doctrine 2, material specific to Doctrine 2, Father Joseph and I will uh, schedule other times, uh, one-hour sessions, where we can invite all of you uh, to come and join us for that material. And once again, uh, if any of you cannot come because of work or other commitments, it will be recorded and available for you to watch at your own convenience. The, the, the syllabi for both Doctrine 2 and Doctrine 1 are available uh, uh, on um, Populi, on Father Joseph's uh, page. Uh, so you just have to go to your uh, particular class or whatever you're enrolled in and you can see the syllabus and you can see the material, the books you need to get and everything. Um, other than that, I hope this clarifies everything. Other than that, um, if you have any more questions, send them to me through the group chat and I will try to address them as much as possible. Thank you, Abuna. I apologize for the interruption. Please continue. Okay, no problem. No, that's a good break for me too. Anyways, uh, for the first uh, presentation, I would like to uh, conclude that by four, uh, four conclusions uh, in response to the challenges that we face in the church and in the little church, our families at the, at the church that is at home, that these are the four uh, responses that we need to give to these challenges that we face in life. First one is, in our gatherings, we should not limit our discussion to what goes in the world whether it is the coronavirus or the stocks or the sports or any other secular concerns such as politics as well. We should engage ourselves in discussing our faith and our other areas of church life, especially as we see it today because of social distancing and because of certain fears that our churches are empty from parishioners because of these restrictions that we get it from our uh, governments, our state governors, or even the federal government. We must develop, secondly, we must develop our concerns to practice corporate and personal obligation of prayer life. For, to mention, the name of God in our own everyday talks is not an empty and wasteful endeavor. For God is present everywhere. He is the creator and the provider of all good things. He does not leave us alone to destiny and circumstances outside of his dispensation. Parents, have their sacred obligations to raise their children in the fear of God, they must prepare them to accept other human beings 
for God has established such beings in their lives. We are not alone. We must learn how to deal with one another accordingly. Thirdly, the emphasis is on the family unit. Christianity is not a collection of individuals with individual rights. The individual does not exist on his or her own accord. Individuals have fathers and mothers. They do not come from a vacuum or from empty, isolated space. And last but not least, rational knowledge and the pursuit of feeding our intellectual curiosity does not necessarily make us better human beings. The Greeks taught us, taught that knowledge is virtue and that knowledge distinguishes between humans and beasts. But in reality, this is not completely sufficient. And it is because of this regard, we begin to indulge ourselves as we will talk about it in this coming Friday concerning the requirements of what it is and how we can seek orthodox knowledge of God in a way that is beyond any intellectual quest, but we will see that as we will be presenting it Friday as being something we give it the attributes of being phenomenological, existential, and also ontological, personal, and mystical as well. And we'll explain that very clearly in next Friday's presentation, how we can seek the knowledge and the way to approach God in his energies and graces, and not to be a simple philosophical system as we find it in our own experiences in the world today. So this is the conclusion of the first presentation. And we are going at, from this point on to seek uh, a continuation of this program. And that would be by making a, in a, a very specific short presentation concerning what we seek when we talk about the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of mind. This is not simply a lecture in philosophy, but in order to see our understanding of rational knowledge, we have to try to see the fundamentals upon which this rational knowledge is established and try to see the difference between that and the way how to see the spiritual knowledge. Again, this will give us also an understanding of the things that will be covered in this coming Friday concerning Doctrine One. So the purpose of these presentations is to explain in proper theological language the distinction between discursive reasoning, the rational knowledge, and the intuitive appreciation of spiritual knowledge known as we shall indulge in that as apophatic knowledge. The distinction then is between the intellect and the mind of Christ, the noose as we have it in Orthodox theology by acquiring the mind of Christ as the center of intelligence in the spiritual growth of the human person. To acquire a vision of a proper theological thinking on the life of the church, its liturgy, its canon law, and its patristic tradition and spiritual theology. An inquiry of the possibility of how God comes to be known. Christianity in its early growth confronted the Greek culture and philosophy and the mystical cults of the Orient. Western thought is the result of this life of thinking. 
In this regard, we are talking about the philosophy of the pre-Socratics. It's the ancient philosophers from the fifth century BC and on. We will talk also shortly uh, on Plato, on Aristotle, and will also have an understanding of the aspect known as Neoplatonism and its impact on the orthodox theological thinking. Even today, the church continues to encounter other trends as secularism, humanism, individualism, socialism, capitalism, and globalization. They are attempts to explain how God is conceived by such traditions and such trends. We come to the understanding the question, how can we come and how God comes to be known to us? If we investigate this problem from an epistemological point of view, we have the following question. If we can know God, how is such knowledge possible? How can we cognize that there is God? Several possible solutions to our problem are suggested. It may be that to know that God is, is impossible, and that is explained by those who appeal to skepticism. Or it may be that we know God by a priori cognition that is independent of experience, something that we may have in our own being, but then we know that it is not shared by all, only by the elite. It may be that there is a special faculty, a religious faculty, which is employed in cognizing God. It could be that knowledge of God is derived from and found in experience. And this is uh, what we find in situation of those who have their own conviction based on what they see and what they experience. The first solution is built on the fact that since our knowledge that God is, is neither open to logical confirmation or empir empirical verification, it follows that we cannot properly be said to know God. We may believe that God is, but certain we can never know him. This is what skepticism is all about. In this way, we will see that we also know him as far as in Orthodox theology. Secondly, as for the second solution is concerned, the question might arise whether knowledge of God is a priori possible, and if supposedly it is possible, a new problem might arise. That is to say, what is a priori must have the mark of being universally and necessarily accepted. The third option, the third solution, presupposes the fact that either all men possess this kind of knowledge or it is limited to certain individuals. In either case, this special faculty comes from God, which leads us again to a vicious circle that we assume God in order to know him. Finally, the adherents of the fourth solution build their assumption on the following syllogism. A, only experience and reason yield to knowledge, and B, reason and experience do not yield 
to knowledge of God, therefore we cannot know God. Hence, to deny the argument, one need only reject one or both of the premises. How does orthodox gnosiology respond? Orthodox gnosiology, or the knowledge of God, is not philosophically oriented for speculation about abstract concepts. It rests on the revelation of God's personal presence as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Orthodox gnosiology is Trinitarian. Man's knowledge of God excludes all abstract and purely intellectual relationship of God with man. Orthodox gnosiology attempts to introduce the wisdom of God to human rationale and that what explains to have divine wisdom. It invites the human person to become a co-worker, to achieve synergy, union and communion with God. Orthodox gnosiology, as we will see, realizes the simple fact that there is always a limit to man's human wisdom due primarily to the imperfection of the human nature after the fall and to man's state of sinfulness. Orthodox gnosiology emphasizes God's saving truth that can make man free and to enable him to know God. Therefore, man's knowledge of God presumes and presupposes not a special faculty available to certain individuals, but a total and a complete existential awareness which involves the whole man created in the image and likeness of God in the presence of a living and personal God. In this way, man's knowledge of God is necessarily the way of deification. In this respect, mystical God is not contra-natural, but a reality not part of the natural order or separate from it, but above it. And this is what we can at least respond to this situation and try to understand what these philosophers have given throughout the history starting from the fifth century on. And we can also see that, you know, to be more specifics that uh, if we put in our own mind, you know, to figure out the Mediterranean, we have on the western side of the Mediterranean and going uh, to the north, we have the Greece and Italy. It is from there these philosophers emerged. And then on the southeastern southern uh, section of the Mediterranean where Christ was born and before that we have the prophetic voices that told the people, the Jewish nation, that this is what the Lord wants. Thus says the Lord. And that is the two comparisons that we find between these two approaches. One that may give his, his own interpretation of the things that, you know, created, that enabled, you know, what it is to exist and the source of being. And then on the other hand, we have God the Creator who talks to human beings through these prophets and ultimately by his only beloved son telling us what the Lord wants us to do. And in this understanding, we can see again from the parable of the vineyard, we, which we heard Sunday during the divine liturgy, the gospel lesson talks about the vineyard as being the Jewish nation that God had chosen and they were his vineyard that he continued to prune it and to take care of it and those who heard 
the prophetic message, thus says the Lord. And at the same time, we have those pre-Socratic philosophers and others who would give us a way to understand how reality comes to being. And that is a series of things, not as one truth that is based in the prophetic words that come to them from God through revelation. So in this regard, we can identify some of these uh, philosophers, and I am sure if you have any philosophy background in the history of philosophy, any introduction of that field, it will see that starting in the fifth, sixth century BC from 429 and for the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, succeeding philosophers from Thales, who claims that uh, the water is the source of everything that is from Anaximenes, Alexander, and uh, Xenophanes, that each one talks about certain things and they are separated between those who are monist, meaning about one source of things that brought this creation of the world to, to in, in, in their own mind, and those who may consider them as the pluralists who combine different sources that come to us in the understanding of all the four elements of creation, starting from water, from fire, from the wind, and from atoms, and so forth. And these are the elements that are brought together to give an understanding that how the world becomes a world of living ideas until we come to the two great philosophers that shape Western civilization and the Western way of thinking, and that is with Plato and Aristotle. In Plato, we have what we know as being the world of idealism, and in Aristotle, his student, we have what is known as the philosophy of realism. So we are talking then about these two great giants that shape and form the entire Western civilization. And we start with Plato with just few words to give us an understanding and that will enable us to see how this approach of rational thinking that can take different shapes and different forms and ultimately in their own way, they also influence and impact some of the church fathers who take either an approach as we see it later in the heresies that were given in the heresy of Arius and the heresy of Nestorius. One leading to what the emphasis is on the fact of uh, realism and the other one is on the fact of idealism where the, uh, the, 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 the divine absorbs the human element as we shall see later in these two heresies and how they were impacted and uh, influenced some of the church fathers and some of them that led to a state of heresy. Father Joseph, so, Father Joseph. Yes. Would it be okay with you for us to take a 10 minute break now? They can, of course, I need that too. Okay, so we, we will take a 10 minute break everybody and we will resume at uh, five minutes past the hour. Five minutes past the hour, okay? Thank you all. Okay. Abuna, do you know when the recording will be available? As soon as this uh, the session is over with Father Antipas, I will convert it to the uh, uh, the YouTube uh, link and I will uh, make it available for you within the hour. Thank you. Have a good break, everybody.
Bona Anton. I think he left, Father. Bona Anthony. I think he left, Father. I wanted to ask you, is it possible? Uh, no, Father, no, I think he's him? left. Huh? This is Subdeacon Joseph, Father. Oh, oh, Subdeacon Joseph. I wanted to talk to Father Anthony. Yeah, I don't I see him to, anywhere. I want him to send me a list of the students that we have for this year so I can have uh, an idea who they are and how many students we have. So when I receive their papers, I know whether uh, they are, are still missing and those who haven't submitted their papers yet. Well, I can tell you that I'm gonna be in your semester, in your class this semester for Doctrine two. It, well, we see that's why what's uh, confusing uh, to me is the fact that we just finished Doctrine two. Um, you know, I just uh, received one last paper for Doctrine two, and I thought that uh, we were uh, coming to this residency program and then Friday deal with Doctrine one and, and continue to do that. But if you're saying that there is Doctrine two, what happened to Doctrine one? We haven't even started yet. That's why I wanted to, uh, to clarify that. This is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's always, uh, you know, very confusing you know, to deal with that without resolving that situation. Right, because yesterday was supposed to be Doctrine 1, and then uh, today was supposed to be Doctrine 2. Well, do, I did not do anything yesterday with Doctrine Buna, 1. Doctrine 1 is usually in the spring. We just finished that in the spring, and then Doctrine 2 usually is in the fall. So in September, we're going to be doing, well, now we should be doing technically Doctrine 2 for this semester. And Doctrine 1 is usually in the spring. We just finished Doctrine 1 in the spring. So what, what do they want to do for Doctrine 2? Do they want, I mean, Friday, Doctrine 2 or 1? I'm still, uh, you know, not well, it sure. Seems with the, with, with what, with, it seems with, with, with what's going now is that now today you're giving a general content about Doctrine 1 and 2, but in, on Friday, as far as I understand, you're going to be focusing on Doctrine 1. And so what happened to the residency program? I thought this is what the, uh, I agreed with Father Michel Najem concerning the presentations for the residency students. Yeah, that's what you're doing now. This is the residency and you're doing a mixed lecture right now, apparently, and then Friday you're doing only Doctrine 1 and you will be setting uh, um, um, some series of Zooms of one hour length at one point to talk specifically about Doctrine 2. Uh, I, think, I, think that, I think that will be next semester, not during mm -hmm. the residency, next semester. Well, the next semester just started. August 31st, technically, is next semester. No, no. This is residency. Then there's ne semester this after This is residency, residency. exactly. That's well, this is exactly. a residency that's, of a that's week, what but I technically think. we started... Sorry, technically we started semester two because all of our other uh, fathers send us the syllabus for the for this semester. And according to the, uh, the House of Studies, the semester starts August 31st. So, like, actually right. a week before the residency. So the people who are in their last year are starting with uh, Doctrine 2 now. For those of us in the second year, we'll be doing Doctrine 1 in the spring. Yes, yes. Well, for example, an example, I'm in Unit 5, and we'll be starting Doctrine 2, or we started supposedly uh, August 31st, we started Doctrine 2. Correct. But Correct. as far as the residency is concerned, we were supposed to have Doctrine 1 yesterday, Doctrine 2 today, but according to what I hear now is somewhere down the line, they've changed something. And now Father Antipas is gonna be again on Friday, but I don't have it on the schedule here that I have. So, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm at a loss with that one as well. Yeah. I so think I have a question. The residency uh, week. Yes. So for the students, Father, uh, who are just, uh, we're three, we're, we're um, that this is our third term. So we, we don't even have Doctrine One or Doctrine Two yet, even for this term. So, uh, but it says for on Friday, there's a class from, this is Eastern Standard Time, 4.30 to 6 o'clock, the panel slash graduate, which wouldn't be to us. So, because we have New Testament at the time that you want to do your doctrine, 
uh, two on Friday, but is there any way that we could uh, move it to Friday at the, the 4.30 Eastern time here so we could make that live? That's, that's not you know, because of- uh, What I was told that we have three things. We have doctrine one, doctrine two, and the presentations are based, uh, you know, to the students that are uh, part of that, uh, you know, understanding categories. And uh, Friday, they, we will, uh, I, I understand, will will give the chance to deal with doctrine one. And this presentation today is part of the residency program. You're supposed to take. Uh, three residency sessions during the course of uh, the studies. And that's how, uh, what we used to do at the Antiochian village, but now because of the situation, we're doing it uh, through Zoom, but it has nothing to do, you know, it, indirectly it is connected. You know, when you talk about Dr. One, you're talking about uh, the way how to understand God and not uh, to understand it in the, in the sense of, uh, being part of the intellectual knowledge and so forth, but in a more spiritual uh, knowledge that, that uh, transcends the, 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 the level. And that's why the presentation will be made Friday based on that light. And that uh, will be I... the way that, uh, you know, the Orthodox Church approaches that uh, knowledge of God, the spiritual knowledge. And then later on with Doctrine 2 will be focused on uh, the, the basically the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. So that, that's why, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that uh, whoever is uh, following uh, that session will know that this is in particular dealing with the residency program, the requirements that we've been doing it at the Antiochian village, but now because of, uh, you know, the, the Corona issue, we are doing it uh, on the Zoom. Abuna, if I might say, uh, say something, uh, because what I understood, like the um, doctrine one, uh, as I said, is usually a unit four. So uh, whoever just mentioned uh, that they're gonna, it's not part of their studies in unit three. That's that's true because uh, they're gonna start that sometime in the spring. So I attended the residency last year physically, and the program has changed, and now we are required to do only two residencies. And uh, the way it was in the past is that during the residency in the summer we cover some of the stuff that we already learned and we submitted papers for and exams for. So meaning units that we already concluded and passed just to review the knowledge and re-emphasize it. And then some presentations pertains to the classes that we're gonna be taking in the fall because the residency falls between the spring semester and the fall semester. So that's the typical uh, use of the residency in addition to the social, to the social aspect and the spiritual aspect of being there. Now, the unit, Doctrine two is we already technically, according to the syllabus, we started that this semester, which is unit five. I'm in your class in doctrine two, which already technically started August 31st. Now, doctrine one is not going to be starting anytime soon. Doctrine one is going to be starting in the spring semester, so after the Christmas break, so in January. So, whatever then, you're presenting now, people who already took your class will benefit from re emphasizing the information, and people who haven't taken the class, it gives them a glimpse of what's gonna be taking place in January, not in the fall. And now I well, then let, let, let's wait when Father Anthony comes in, we will be able uh, you know, to know whether we wanted to deal with Doctrine 2 or with Doctrine 1 this Friday. It, is, is this Abuna, a- Abuna, do, you have, uh, do you have any Doctrine 2 lectures ready right now? Not now, no, I was not prepared. I was uh, prepared as we discussed last week to do a residency today and doctrine one tomorrow. If you want me to do doctrine two to Friday, I will do it. But I think that would know be which more one, beneficial. Because... You know, to to uh, no, it's fine, to, no, that's, to give. No, no, that's going to cause more confusion. Let let's let me chime in again and explain, please, everybody. Once again, Father Joseph was supposed to do doctrine one yesterday. He couldn't because of his schedule. I had explained that, and I said that uh, I'm going to send you a link uh, for Doctrine 2, for, sorry, for Doctrine 1 for Friday. So on Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, he's going to do the Doctrine 1 lectures. And that's, even though, like Habib said, that's for the spring, 
but we were told by the House of Studies that they're supposed to take place at this residency. And then in the spring, we will have more classes, uh, in individual classes with, with me setting it up for Father Joseph to do Doctrine 1. As far as Doctrine 2 is concerned, take notes and, and uh, listen to this lecture. And uh, like I said, this is an introductory lecture that has elements of both Doctrine 1 and Doctrine 2 in it for the material, as far as uh, you need. And then later on, uh, this month and in October, we will have further sessions set up for you specific to Doctrine 2, for those of you who are in Doctrine 2 in the class for the fall. So we, we can do that also the following week, you know, in September too, if you want. Yes, we, I, as soon, you know, and I, I will, uh, I will do, um, I will be in touch with you and I will, I will set those up for you and uh, everything is going to okay, be just be one minute. You will have your Doctrine 2 class. Uh, let's just lectures for now. No, I, I do have a question. Can I, can anyone hear me? Yes, John. Okay. Um, so I'm looking on my popular right now and the dates of the three classes I'm going to describe says August 31st, 2020, December 18th. So it's this current semester for me. I have scripture two, liturgical theology two, and patristics. Um, am I missing some classes or am I in the wrong lecture series? I only saw one option in the residency two uh, calendar, uh, which was to attend these courses. No, well, these are the classes we took last semester as well. These are the correct classes for, for unit three. Right. So this is just a class and it has nothing to do with the actual courses I'm taking. The father and the this. That is the point. Yes, residency is separate from unit three or unit five, regardless of what unit in. Residency is not part of that. Just accept that. Uh, yes and no. I'm, because I'm okay so with that. I, it's just a lot of other people are asking questions that are making me ask questions. I'm, I'm here, got my seat belt buckled in, in the back seat, ready to go on a ride. All right, everybody, let's resume. Uh, if you could all please mute your mics. Uh, and uh, Abuna, you're, you're ready to go again. Yeah, I'm ready. But as I said earlier, again, if, if you want to, uh, you know, to make uh, those changes, I'll be happy to, uh, to do it uh, this coming Friday at two o'clock. We can uh, do even both one and two. I can do both uh, lectures and that will give the, whoever is taking one or two, you know, at least to, 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 to listen to the requirements and some of the explanation about the two uh, courses. Okay, we can set that up, uh, you and I, and, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll send uh, the announcements accordingly. So maybe and at the same time, I would like to uh, get a list uh, of all the students that belong to both uh, one and two. I wanted to see the entire list so I know exactly when they send their papers that I know who sent it and who did not and how many students we have in each uh, course. I, I will get those lists for you, Abuna. Okay, okay. So so we'll, we'll continue then uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, presentation concerning uh, the philosophical approach uh, starting from the pre-Socratics down to what we know as the monists and the pluralists and then we, we come to uh, understanding of uh, the uh, philosophy of Plato and of Aristotle. Plato was born in 427 BC and uh, it is uh, very hard to distinguish between the philosophy of Plato and that of his teacher, Socrates. Plato uh, represents his ideas in the form of dramatic dialogues in which Socrates was the leading actor. So that to this day, we do not know just when the thought of Socrates leaves off and the thought of Plato begins. Plato is uh, uh, known for 36 dialogues and uh, uh, 
27 of them are considered as, uh, you know, questioned, and some of them are spurious. You know, it's not, uh, they, they are referred to Plato, but in fact, he is not the author of that. Uh, we know that uh, the school uh, of uh, that the Academy of Plato uh, lasted over 900 years, and it was to do to uh, the Emperor Justinian, who closed the Academy of Plato in the year 529 as a pagan institution. Plato was deeply concerned with the nature of the world. In his uh, dialogues in the Timaeus and Republic, Plato writes, God created the world because he was good and desired that all things should be like him. He built it as an architect, builds a temple in accordance with a pattern that, uh, that, that existed in his mind a copy of a plan. The world is the image of his mind. It has a visible body and an invisible soul. The body is the temporary, the soul is eternal. Time for Plato is the shadow of eternity. The body is full of imperfections. The soul is perfect. Every object of the world and every living creature from the highest angel in the heavens to the lowest animals of the earth are possessed of a perishable body and an imperishable soul. Through the study, of philosophy, man is given the greatest good by the gods. There is a divinity within us which God has lodged in our heads to raise us from the earth to heaven. Bishop Epiphanius of Salamis in Sipes counted 106 heresies and 100 of them were related with Plato. Even death in the philosophy of Plato is a transition from life, the shadow and the immortality and the substance. Death is the door that leads us into the eternal and ideal world of which the temporary and material world is but a copy. Plato's most fascinating subject is his theory of ideas. There are two words, the unreal world as it appears in our senses and the real world as it exists in the realm of ideas. Every object in the unreal world is the imperfect copy of a permanent idea. There is one single, unchangeable, eternal, and perfect idea of man, and there have been innumerable, changeable, and imperfect copies of this idea of man fashioned out of matter into the form of man. There is an eternal pattern of a person or a thing or a quality. The idea as a shining light surrounded by myriads of mirrors. And this is one of the examples that he gives that some of the mirrors could be concave, some could be smooth, some could be rough, and some could be broken. All mirrors reflect the images of the eternal light, yet no two reflections are the same. Unreal mere appearances, copies of the shining light, 
and suppose that one of the mirrors is suddenly smashed, the light has disappeared in that mirror, it is dead, but it is only the reflection that appears to have died. The light which caused the reflection keeps shining forever. Our senses, declares Plato, deceives us. They observe only the world of appearances. It is the intellect alone that can teach us to understand reality. Those who rely on their senses are like men imprisoned in a cave which has a mouth open towards the light, but the prisoners cannot see the light. They see only before them and there is a blazing fire behind them and a black wall in front. What they see is the moving shadow which is cast upon the wall in front. This is the image that is given in the theory of knowledge as far as um, Plato is concerned. In his book, The Republic, there is also, he says, nothing specific to know. Nothing fully exists in general. The more variable and relative we find anything that the less real and knowledgeable we consider it to be. Reality itself really exists. It is the particular figures we see through our eyes that are not fully real, since they have no fixed and abiding character. Figures drawn will vanish when this page is destroyed, but circularity itself is not the kind of thing that can be destroyed or created either. It is what it is eternally. Circularity is not a space and time. Forms, therefore, exist independently of the things we perceive through our senses. Sensible things are real insofar as they measure to or resemble or participate in the forms and they are unreal in so far as they do not. The pursuit of knowledge, the episteme as Plato teaches, is thinking and there are ways to discern the nonsensible things such as geometry. And that is what we try to understand the kind of theology and of philosophy that we find in the philosophy of Plato, that what we experience in the world through our senses is nothing but imperfect. The only perfect things is the realm of the idea and the idea of the good is the highest of such uh, uh, understanding of the reality. This is what we can uh, consider as being the realm of the philosophy of idealism that reshaped many of the philosophers of Western theology and even it affected some of the church fathers and some of the even language that the church used when it came from some monastic and ascetical sources that considered that the body is nothing but vanishes and something that we have to focus only on the soul. And what we find today in our own culture is the fact that when we talk about immortality, we are talking about immortality as by nature. You know, when, when you go and you deal with secular human beings today in our own culture, they would say that the immortality of the soul is immortal by nature. Whereas in our own understanding of theology, it is 
immortal by the will of God. And that is the big difference that we find in the two worlds. So in Aristotle's uh, picture of the universe, Aristotle, who was born in the year 384 BC, he is also the father of what is known as realism, concrete realism. Like Plato, Aristotle believed in the realm of ideas and in the existence of matters. But unlike Plato, he maintained that ideas or forms existed not outside, but inside the material object of the world form and matter are inseparable. Form is grown out of matter and matter which is growing into form. Therefore, matter is always that process of transformation. An acorn has within it the urge, the potential to become an oak tree, which is actual. A child is the process that moves from within that potential into becoming actual as being a man. Form is the principle of growth, resides in everything, the shape of the thing as it is, and the shaping of things into which it is to develop. Aristotle talks about the, the structure of what he calls the entelechy, which means the term that is for the full actualization of development that are not endless. They have final stages at which the potentialities in question are realized and appropriate entities are reached. Actuality is prior to potency and potency is the potential becoming actual only by the agency of some actually existing thing of the same speeches. And that brings us what we find today when we talk about the chicken and the egg. What comes first? In the philosophy of Aristotle, it is the chicken that comes and the egg is the potential of becoming a chicken. And therefore, the chicken comes first and the egg comes as in the realm of potency. Inner instincts for growth reside in every object and are the purpose of the universe. A matter opposes its formative purpose when there is no harmony between the body and the soul and an object then nature records one of its failures. Since matter is the basis of potentiality in things, the agent must be without matter, a pure individual form which moves without being moved. And to be moved is to change, and change requires matter. The supreme, you know, according to his mind, the supreme agent as being the God becomes in Aristotle's philosophy as the unmoved mover as what he calls to be God. He is the final cause of all the movement and of all growth. In Aristotle's metaphysics, God is not the create, creator of motion. Therefore, God is a scientist, not a poet a mover, not a maker of the universe. In Plato's philosophy, God is the architect. Here he is the scientist, the unmoved mover of the universe, be a person or a thing or a thought, is a mover and every move is impelled by something 
to move something else. The plow moves the soil. The soil is moved by the hand and the hand moves the plow and the plow is moved by the brain and the brain moves the hand and it is finally the desire for the food that moves the brain, the instinct for life. The master, according to him, that of every slave is the slave of some other master. Even absolute tyrant is the slave of his ambition. Therefore, in the philosophy of Aristotle, God is the source of all motion, the unmoved mover of the universe. God is passionless, inaccessible, changeless, and perfect. We, we talk about that when we see some of the attributes that are given to orthodox theology as given in terms of such uh, uh, what is known as apophatic. He moves everything, but is moved by nothing. God moves the world as the beloved object moves the lover without being moved. He produces motion within us all by being loved, like in a drawing room, a beautiful naked model absorbed in her own thoughts. She looks at and nobody, but everybody looks at her. If God is motionless, we ask the question, how can he be the cause of all motion? Again, from the philosophy of Aristotle, we reach the, the we can reach into some disappointing climax. If God is not the creator of the world, he is also not a benevolent provider concerned for the well-being of his creatures. Having criticized Plato for believing that forms exist apart from the sensible things, he in turn around and argue that at least one such form exists and that is God. We continue again with the different philosophies, you know, such as uh, Epicureanism and Stoicism, but we come in the third century in 2005 to 2070 and to, to AD, and that is in the philosophy of Neoplatonism that is uh, given uh, and interpreting Plato by Plotinus who flourished in the third century in Plotinus, uh, we see Plato lived again, as St. Augustine had said in his uh, reflections. And this is the main book that he gives, the Aeneas, which, is, uh, which contains a wealth of conclusions and brief indications of the reasoning by which Plotinus arrived at in the metaphysics of Plotinus, as found in his Aeneas, we have a triad. We have what is known as the One, who is the highest essence of God, the ultimate good that transcends all earth existence, things and all through incomprehensible, indescribable, silent contemplation through contemplative mood you identify with the divine, the emanation and union and the spirit as a second uh, person of that triad. And then you have the nous, which means the spirit, the intelligence, the reason, and the second essence. And it is considered as he refers to that as the image of God in the material world and the emanation according to him from God as light emanates from the sun, it confirms with God and with the will. And it is also a direction of the thinking of man 
to the interpretation of God's law, then it comes to the soul as the third essence, which is the emanation from the spirit. It creates the material world out of the memory and to the divine. Death in the understanding of this Neoplatonism gives us the freedom as we find in the philosophy of Plato, freeing the soul from the burden of their bodies. Plotinus actually tried four times as he did away in his leprosy at 66 to bring back the God in you to the divine in the all. And that is what he referred to as the ecstasy, as the going back to the main source in the philosophy of Plotinus is the final stopping stepping stone to the scholastic philosophy of the church. Plotinus observes one of the British philosophers, Burton Russell, in is both an end and a beginning, an end as to regards to the Greeks and a beginning as regards of Christendom. And that is also a question about the Western understanding of uh, Christianity, where we have this uh, influence as given by the philosophies and by the writings of uh, Western uh, thought uh, theologians that emerged in the 13th and 14th century. And this is, uh, it gives us uh, a conclusion and uh, an introduction about the understanding of how this source of rational knowledge emerges, whether it is from the philosophy of Plato in terms of the idealism and the impact that it left on some of the church fathers and especially those who were in the monastic and ascetical life and again, it is still evident and available. We read that in uh, some of the language that we use, uh, you know, in uh, you know the, the the church services when it talks about the two elements that bring the understanding of the human person: one, the body and the soul. And always, uh, when we remember some of the monastic fathers in some of the hymns that we use in the church, we talk about the body as being perishable and the soul as being immortal. And this is not to give us the understanding that the soul is immortal by nature, because that is contrary to the understanding of the church. It is immortal only by the will of God, and it becomes perishable on the day of judgment where those who uh, did not fulfill their life as good you know, uh, Christians and stewards, that their separation from God indicates that they are no longer immortal by nature, but they go into everlasting punishment. But this would be a different topic that we will deal in maybe in the future. At this time now, we also know that uh, based on uh, some of the things that uh, we talked about in terms of what Orthodox Gnosiology is all about, and in terms of some of these uh, uh, examples and samples that we had from both Plato and Aristotle and others, we have to come to the understanding of the discursive reasoning and the spiritual truth, how it is expressed and experienced and given in the life of the church. It is necessary then to make a distinction between the news as discursive ads, discursive reason, and news as the intellect or the organ of the supra-rational intuitive apprehension of the spiritual growth, which relates to the essence of man in all the multiplicity of his personal existence. We know that in the Old Testament, 
there is one important reference in Isaiah, Isaiah 55, that shows that the spiritual intellect should not be equated with discursive reasoning. In the New Testament, the term appears predominantly in Paul's writing. Plato's theory of knowledge stems from his understanding that the organ of knowledge is not reducible to the senses, but it springs from a divine element in the soul that knows the transcendent forms and eternal objects and thereby reveals its own eternity. This is seen clearly in Plato's threefold distinction between opinion, refers to them as doxa, resting on sense experience, reason, dianonia, which is mathematical reason, and nous, revealing unchanging reality, the distinction between reason and nous, then it is an old one. The distinction then between the opinions, between the reason, which is mathematical, and the reason, the nous, that is the higher uh, element of that knowledge. Aristotle's notion of the nous is to be distinguished from mere reasoning and applies to the apprehension of the eternal intelligible substance or first principles and indeed to the highest divine mind. He distinguishes between discursive syllogistic reason and nous as intuitive understanding which approaches the notion of enlightenment. The Neoplatonic nous is a kind of self-determination of the life that emanates from the one. The church fathers gave the soul under significant than nous. Thus, the soul has many members, one of which is the nous. Patristic, and by the way, when we talk about the soul, we are talking about in the, in the church father's understanding as the human person, the, the composite of both soul, body, and mind. That uh, when he talks about the news, patristic theology considers news to be beyond mere rationality, intellectuality, and conceptuality. It is seen rather as the image of God, as the focus of personality, and as the source of, of character and intelligence, therefore news as power of spiritual perception is related to the following. And this is what brings the human person into that full composite understanding we are first talking about the human person as a whole. We are talking about the body. We're talking about the heart, about the intellect, about what is known as the mind of Christ, the phronema of Christ, the activity of meditating and concentrating on God, the ascetic life in general, and even to the demons as power extraneous to and interfering with the inherent function of the intellect in terms of the prayers. And we talk about this particular understanding of the news in terms of healing and in terms of the total understanding as we are given in the parable that uh, is given to us by the philosophy and by the theology of the church fathers, and especially by the great apostle Paul, who tells us that we are members of the body of Christ, and we are called to be the church 
and we were reunited in the faith and in the one baptism in one Lord and we are also gathered together by our partaking of the body and blood of our Lord that goes through our veins and we are participants as one body in the one cup and that is the reason that brings us to the understanding of who we are as being temples of the Holy Spirit that is sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit in chrismation. We become dedicated to Christ and we move by the Spirit of God and we become followers saved by none other than our Lord and by following a pure conduct and to become Christians, not by name, but by own faith, reminding, reminding us by the words of St. Paul that if anyone does not love our Lord Jesus Christ, he will be uh, excommunicated. That means it is by having our membership in Jesus Christ, not by identity, but by accepting our life to hear the word and to take that as a way of life following his commandments even unto the end. And that is what brings us to understand this particular uh, notion of the news, the mind of Christ. So the first step would be how we can deal with the intellect and of the human person. News signifies the intellect as the superior faculty of the soul uniting man to God. In this case, nous is identified with the prosopon, with the person, a word which interprets the ultimate dimension of the human person. Nous signifies the human person as a rational being, properly speaking. As long as man's noose is in good order, he is fully conscious and is certainly alive. However, the identification of noose with the person is in no sense an indication that man is reduced to the intellect. The noose and the body. The church fathers stress the close relationship between the nous and the inner form and the body as the outer appearance. In St. Paul's words, especially in Romans 7.22, this relationship is reciprocal. On the other hand, there is no dualism between soul and body. The body is not excluded from the human person, it is not evil in itself, as we may consider Platonism and Neoplatonism. All nature and its indications should be turned towards God, reoriented God words. The news influences and is influenced by the body and indeed by parts of the body. Man's whole life, even to its smallest element, has a bearing upon the intellect. And that is the reason that in the residency program, when we talk about the human person, the second presentation for us will be in terms of this understanding of the connection of the noose as a rational ability and the body of the human person will be seen in terms of studying what dualism is all about. That dualism that may lead into some heretical understanding as we see it embedded in the philosophy of Platonism and the understanding of the human person in Christian theology as the composite of a human soul and mind and body. So the body is not excluded from the human person. In fact, as I said, even the smallest parts of the human life has a bearing on the intellect. 
for instance, some of the things that we do in our own life, fasting, for instance, becomes an example which is of no account in the understanding of by itself. There is no merit or reward attached to it as such, but excess of food causes sensuousness and fills us with unclean images. An empty stomach frees the intellect for concentration on God, whereas concerns for with food infest us with the cares of this life, which the claim of fallen nature. To this end, the words of Vladimir Lusky, who says the intellect must find its sustenance in God, must live from God. Any substitution is a betrayal of the love for God. It is a form of idolatry, a self-delusion. We think we possess life, but in fact, we are only in possession of dying images. And that was the reason that when we talked about the three categories that we find in the world, the first category, the people of the world, and then the people of the intellect, and the people of the heart. Here we see the idea that once we are enslaved by the things that we consume and our possessions, we are chasing dying images. And it is not something that is lasting that leads to what we call the pursuit of eternal life. How can the body positively influence the intellect? First of all, we find what is known in Orthodox spirituality as the ears. The spiritualization of the body shows itself in a physical form through tears. We weep as we see God, whom we love. We weep as we recognize our uncleanness, having found him. And this is one what we find from the some of the ascetic fathers like John uh, of the Ladder, when he talks about the baptism of tears as the second baptism, which is the baptism of repentance. We also have the bodily posture. An outward bodily posture reflects the inward attitude of prayer. For example, to lift up one's hand and eyes to heaven, as we refer to that during the divine liturgy, let us lift our hearts the stretching out of one's hand in the form of a cross to heaven, calling on God, are all gestures symbolic of the lifting up of the intellect towards God and is reflected in Eastern liturgical practice. And in a sense, the bodily motion symbolizes the grace of God, which alone can save us and unto which the human person surrenders in prayer. It signifies the movement of man towards God and a movement of God towards man. In this regard, we talk about the prostrations, about the kneeling, about the uh, bowing, and even during certain seasons, as we find it in some monastic circles, when they begin to move things, including even the chandeliers, as an indication of the joy of the resurrection of Christ. So in this thing that we see, that all that, what we find in the divine liturgy, some of the things that pertains to the body and to the movements of the body during the divine liturgy, we face the East, we sign the uh, cross uh, on our forehead and in our body. We have the kneeling, we have the full participation in terms of the things that we do in the little entrance and in the great entrance. We have what is known as the physicality of worship. We have the worship that is done 
in the sacraments of the church, we have the immersion of the body in the water. We have the chrismation to anoint all the senses of the body. And we have the oil that is used for the healing of soul and body. Even in the sacrament of marriage, we have the unity of the invisible God with the two men and women coming together to be one in Christ. And at the same time, even in the sacrament of the holy orders, we have the placing of the hand and we have the partaking of the Holy Eucharist as uniting ourselves, our soul and body for the forgiveness of sins and for life everlasting by partaking the body and the blood of our Lord in the forms of bread and the wine. And ultimately what we do for our loved ones that are separated from this life into eternal life by giving that final kiss to our loved ones. And that is what we find in our liturgical life and the prayers of the church. Also, we find the intellect in terms of meditation and concentration on God. The intellect has an inherent impetus towards the divine. Consequently, every thought which separates the intellect, the news from God, even if it appears to be good, is not only from the devil, but is the devil itself in its entirety. The intellect is easily distracted because it exists in a distracted body, in a fallen state. Basil the Great says that the intellect is constantly liable to dispersion, but must continually be brought back. Through the day, even at night, the body is active. It moves, sees, feels, suffers. It is difficult task for the intellect to sort out or discern good memories to be preserved and to remain on the straight and narrow path. Village vigilance should be unceasing. The intellect is forever productive of thoughts. The rational intellect is the father of thoughts. Virtues, St. John of the Ladder says, one should provide the intellect with good thoughts. What condemns us is not that evil thoughts enter into us. We should fight them using the very tactics the demons employ. A list of the thoughts which any Christian can foster, it will be, for instance, the remembrance of God, of his love, and of his kingdom, zeal for the saints, evocation of God's presence and of that of the angels, death and the accountability of the last judgment, the fear of hell. On the other hand, the emphasis is on the intellect being naked, stripped of all images. This is the apathetic approach to prayer, the notion of is a process which involves the purific purification of physical and psychological urges in order to receive the grace of God. This pure purity of thought and inward vigilance enables the thought to be centered on God. The intellect becomes a mediator between man's whole person and God. It operates in the transformation of his life into our own. It intimates his presence within us and within all what we do or say. The intellect becomes a vehicle of God himself. 
vigilance should be continual. A vigilant intellect can see God. Indeed, purity is the natural condition of the intellect. It is contrasted with the hardened state when the intellect is no longer susceptible of the tender action of God's grace, which enables man to behold him. In this All right, regard, Rabona. we, yes. Uh, if you don't mind, can we take another break now? Okay, sure, of course we can. All right, everybody, uh, I have 12.57, we will resume, uh, I mean 12.57 Pacific, at 57 after the hour, we will resume at 10 minutes past the hour, so 4, 10 Eastern, uh, 1, 10 Pacific. Father Joseph, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So I, I hear all of this, you know, how the Orthodox are supposed to live and, how, you know, doing these prayers and we're focusing with the noose and, you know, uh, and this is, this is our purpose in life, right? You know, holy, this is our purpose is, you know, towards salvation and into paradise and to transform our lives here so we can stand within, you know, his light on the other side in our true life. But, but he, the thing is that this life that, you know, we're supposed to ascertain to, it's not uh, accepted by society. It's not accepted by your family. It's not looked at as uh, uh, something real in the world because that's that part. And but you still have to live in the world. You have to, you know, be a dentist or you know a lawyer or you know all these things that are thrown at us, right? So my what, question what is, is, yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, like. Uh, through life, we've all been given these um, circumstances, and we are each being transformed by it. We each have our uh, own personal encounters with with Christ, right? With with God. Okay. And what we do with those encounters, uh, uh, and we're trying to digest them pretty much on our own. Uh, until we meet people, you know, like you or somebody that, that guides the person, right? But the whole thing is, is that you, that person, if you're not living on Mount Athos, if you're not living in a convent or a monastery in Ocala, Florida or something, you know, you are not accepted uh, within society. You're not accepted within your family. You're not accepted. So like it's, all this is good and stuff, but taking that cloak, it's not an easy, um, uh, it's not an easy, it's, it's almost like it's not supposed to be for this world. You know what I'm saying? Okay, you know what, uh, I, I would say the following. You know, nobody said that Christian life is an easy way of life. It is, uh, as we read in the gospel, it is the narrow way. The narrow way is the way that gives us the opportunity to make choices. We have choices in front of us. You know, Jesus Christ says that we are in this world. We are not to judge the world or condemn the world, but we are to save the world. But in order to do that, we have to make a choice. As Jesus says, you are in the world, but you are not out of the world. You are not... Uh, part of this fallen reality. You are given the opportunity to transcend that fallen reality. And that's what we see that there is a sense of growth in the things that we do from the time God created the world to the time that sin entered the world 
and how it is deviated and uh, separated from God and how we can restore that relationship back by the coming of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So it depends on how we place our priorities and how, what we want to please. Do we want to please our Lord and do things according to his, uh, you know, uh, understanding and his own uh, way of life, which is the way of the cross? It's not going to be easy. And how we want to be? Do we want to, to do things in terms of uh, what we want to the world give us? You know, the world only, uh, you know, tries to uh, maintain uh, all the elements of uh, greatness, the positions, the uh, possessions, and uh, all the things that we want to they take and make ourselves uh, mightier, stronger, and richer, and so forth. And, uh, you know, the message of the Lord that tells us we have to learn how to give and to love and to uh, offer our life as a sacrifice, uh, which is uh, the narrow way and the, the choices that we make, we, we, we are, uh, you know, in the long run are going to be judged by our choices. And if we take that seriously, there is no other options. If we want to, uh, you know, to, to please uh, anybody and to try to be uh, almost liked by everybody and appreciated by what we do, then we have taken a different uh, approach that uh, Christ is not, uh, telling us we Christ says if you love father or mother or child or anyone more than me you are not worthy of me so how do we take that and how do we live that it is a choice that we have to do in the long run uh, we understand that when we talk about salvation we are saved with others what we do with those who are around us the the ones that we help the, the ones who are hungry and we provide food, those who are in prison and we visit, and those who are, uh, you know, uh, marginalized in our life and we try to bring them into the fold and all that stuff. And Christ would say, you have done those to me by doing that to them. They are my little brethren. If we fail to do it, then we will be away from uh, the, the, the presence of God in our life and then the only thing that we do, we can say from Christian perspective that if we are saved, we are saved with others. The only thing that we can do alone is to go to hell. And that is uh, one of the things that we, we need to understand the priorities that we have in life and to make the right choice. And hopefully whatever we do based on uh, what uh, we do what we observe and how we take our Christian identity, you know, seriously, not in a quantitative way. You know, the history of the church is not based on how many Christians existed throughout the 2000 years. We talk about the quality. That's not a question of statistics to say how many millions and how many, uh, you know, hundreds of millions we have uh, Christians. It's the quantity that you know, we put on the side and focus on the quality of faith. And that is the faith that brings the synergy between us and God. And in the long run, it is what uh, Orthodox theology teaches us. And that is the cooperation with our own will being created as free agents and making a choice to be with God. If we surrender that agent, then we become enslaved whether it is searching for wealth or for positions or for power or for education or for you know, feeding the intellect and at the same time being popular as uh, you know, we want to be in the world and then we lose ourselves. Do we say, we, we, do we gain everything in the world and lose ourselves? What benefit it is for us? That is the message that we get when we uh, refer to uh, the cross of our Lord, which is a feast that we will celebrate this coming Sunday, which is important to, to know where our priorities are. And that's why when we study, uh, you know, theology, it, we, we ask God to open our mind to understand what is being, uh, you know, read. As I said earlier, you know, you may uh, read the 
hundreds of books of, of theology and uh, listen uh, to uh, many lectures, but if you don't translate that into action and try to, to live it in everyday experience within the brethren in the church, within the community as uh, being uh, neighbors and so forth, or within the little church that is in the home. This is the responsibility that we need to establish in order to understand in what framework can actually and truly live that faith. And that, that is basically the, 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 the challenge. And uh, we know that uh, when it comes to our uh, synergy and participation with the grace of God, that's why we have uh, different uh, you know, levels of those who fully uh, participate and cooperate with, with, with God's uh, you know, life and energies and uh, you know, presence, and those who are uh, you know, trying to, uh, to do it 50-50. But Christ does not say that uh, you, know, you, 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 you can uh, you know, compromise, take this and take that and make it 50-50. You know, he refers to those who are lukewarm and those who are uh, not fully committed to what uh, the, the, the message is coming from him. And therefore, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, he says, uh, our entire life, our entire being must be uh, in that full understanding, despite all the challenges that we encounter. And that's why we always uh, are in a state of renewal. It is not uh, something that we, we do at once, and, and, and we, we fail the, to continue. If we do not live that, then we, 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 you know, whatever we experience in the church will be nothing but a ritual. You know, the baptism, for instance, if we baptize our children, you know, to, to become, uh, you know, renewed and to have their second birth and we do it and we don't follow and continue to understand our citizenship and membership of the church, then that baptism will be nothing but a shower. It, is, uh, it will be useless and it will be uh, ineffective. If we take it seriously though, then it becomes uh, an invitation to a life. And uh, we, we cannot expect uh, you know, to live uh, in our own uh, you know, foolishness in the world and try to uh, just uh, claim that we are doing something righteous. If we are, uh, you know, living uh, the, the, that righteousness, we can appeal to that. But, you know, to play on both sides of, of that realm, it will be uh, difficult to maintain and then we lose. We cannot claim, you know, to say I am uh, a Christian and at the same time uh, I don't uh, participate in the life of the church or I do not live that life in our families. It is, it is a real challenge, but we have to take it by, you know, it's, we always know that it is not based on our own self-righteousness. We are doing it because of the work of God and his spirit and his energies within us. If we cooperate, we begin to see ourselves through purification, through that, that uh, looking for the sanctification, being uh, separated from the world and ultimately becoming deified. That is the stages that we go through in order to understand our mission and our identity. And if we fail to do that, then it will be nothing but empty talk. All right, Abuna. A amen. Thank you, Father. Okay. Abuna. And uh, it is now 1.10 uh, or 10 minutes after the hour. So Abuna, uh, this, this is the final stretch. Uh, you have 50 minutes uh, in which you could uh, finish your lecture if you'd like. Abuna, can I you ask mean the, the last time or khalas? No, just uh, uh, just for today. Just finish, for today, you have 50 minutes left, 5-0. Okay, all right, no problem. Abuna, can I ask a very quick so, question? Someone asked before, but just want to make this request before, because I, I have to go to a different class. Uh, uh, I'm in Doctrine 2. Uh, would it be possible at one point early on in this semester or even in this uh, residency to cover a little bit the doctrine two requirements so we can start early on on things. As I told Father Anthony Friday, I will do both doctrine one and doctrine two. And I will explain the requirements, the things that we need to, to know and uh, 
to make the presentations very based on both. If uh, we give uh, one hour for each, I think it will be sufficient and we will do it and it will cover both uh, Doctrine 1 and Doctrine 2 as well. If time allows us and if Father Anthony gives us that uh, privilege to do, do it through uh, the next presentation on Friday. I already set it up, everybody. I already set it up and I sent you the link on the group chat. It's already set up the Zoom meeting ID with no password required for you to, to chime in at two o'clock Eastern on Friday. Father will do one hour of Doctrine One, like he said, and then one hour to, uh, to 90 minutes he has, uh, if you would like, uh, for Doctrine Two. So just look, follow the, the, the chain of the uh, group chat back uh, to uh, the post from me with, with the meeting ID, and it's also going to be posted on the residency board. I just sent an email to Father David Alexander. You, you have received the syllabus for Doctrine 1 and 2. You have them uh, in your possession. All you need to do is uh, read them, read uh, the, the scope of uh, both uh, courses, and read uh, the requirements in terms of the questions and essays that you need to prepare. The, you can read also about the books. We can spend a few minutes uh, Friday to go through both of them. And then I will uh, conclude that with the presentations about uh, the, the uh, way of the knowledge and also the, uh, the understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity as uh, within the scope of doctrine too. Okay. Are we ready now to continue? Yes, Abuna, please proceed. Okay. So then we were, we're talking about uh, what we uh, read that uh, uh, when we talk about the human person, uh, we, any, any action that, that requires uh, God's grace, which uh, enables man to behold him, as we read in the Beatitudes, blessed, Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Any separation then becomes sinful, and their harmonious relationship ensures the edification of man's personality in the life of grace. The patristic vision of God in man's intellect and heart has a further implication of stressing God's mystery beyond knowledge, yet known in his inwardness in us. God is well known within our intellect, writes Simeon, the new theologian. He is not someone who made us and then withdrew into some heavenly dwelling place. His kingdom and universe are within our hearts. Thus, man is a microcosm according to him thus anthropology and theology share the same language the intellect in the life of the christian in terms of achieving those virtues of humility and meekness the natural state of the intellect is humility Humility guards us from the demons and from liability. Man is subject to temptations, but this is not determined by total causality. Humility offers resistance to demons who attack us and, and seek to steal our intellect. Humility or meekness is indeed opposite to anger which darkens our intellect. For Christians, the intellect is not divine, unlike what the Platonists and Stoics say by nature, not a substitute for God, and should therefore be humble and filled with love for its creator. The effect of the demons. Satan's method is deceit. Evil thoughts darken the intellect. Spiritual blindness is the result of every demon attacks. However, 
The destruction is never absolute. A darkened intellect leads to irrational, insane deed. Humility makes us commend ourselves into grace and into the mercy of God. And so God himself must be resurrected in man in order of man to be resurrected in him. God arises in us first so his enemies can be scattered and those who hate him will flee from before his face. This sums up the patristic understanding of repentance, the metania, as a conversion of the noose, a changing of the entire orientation of the human person. The virtue of love, the concentration of the intellect on God's is closely linked with love of others. In love, the human person obeys the divine will freely. An outgoing of the human person like a ladder of ascent and descent, which signifies man's function as microcosm before God and the world. Man as a mediator, physical eros is an image of the divine eros, preserving the intellect always directed towards gives birth to love of God. The intellect and the act of prayer. Prayer is an attitude of love involving a person to person relationship. Prayer is an entire art, not a mere invocation or a lip service. True prayer is loving relationship with God. It is what Isaac the Syrian writes, the intellect is enlightened through prayers. On the other hand, the relationship between work and prayer is very important. For no labor, including intellectual activity, such as reading, is an end in itself. What you read must lead to action. Work and prayer cannot be set apart. Prayer, as in the Latin word ora, is absorbed with work, which is labora. Ora and labora, work itself becomes prayer, and prayer becomes an inward movement towards God, and so as the human person goes through the stages of life, changing in many ways, he or she remains the person that he or she is, endowed with a body, a heart, and an intellect, standing in an intimate relationship with each other, so intimate that they flow into each other, the thing remains that a certain hierarchy must be established within that relationship with the noose watching over the heart and impressions, the heart ruling the body, yet being infused by the heart and receiving depend on each other and above all on God's action in them, on man being everything in the sight of God. So this is what we see that as an answer to the question that was given to me during the break, that we may talk about Christian life because of the challenges and the things that we encounter, whom we want to please and whom we want to, to follow and uh, you know, try to make ourselves known but what is important that we have to please God first and we have to understand our mission as doing things 
within the church, within our community, with one another, and within the scope of our little church that is in the family, and at the same time, see ourselves growing and maintaining that through our love, through our humility, through our obedience, and by our prayers and our fasting, both of them, that leads to the understanding where we have the opportunity not only to have our words heard by God, but at the same time to give ourselves to hear the will of God, what God's will is for us, and how we can receive that challenge as a way of life. So in this world, as we have reached so far, just it's important to, to understand how uh, things are uh, being you know, developed in this uh, presentation itself concerning the contrast and the differences between uh, rational uh, knowledge and uh, spiritual knowledge. We see that uh, we have to understand first that the goal of human life is communion with God. In Hellenistic anthropology, the mind becomes the center of a human being. In Christianity, we have a synthesis of mind and heart. In the writing of the Philokolia, prayer or communion with God is defined as standing in communion, as standing in the presence of God with the mind in the heart. All of this is to say that the restless in man's soul and the thirst to know and worship God is rooted in the fact that man in the entirety of his being comes from out of God. That is that this restless through should find its consummation in Jesus of Nazareth is due to the fact that he is the source of all being, the image in whom we were created. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, where principalities or authorities, all, all things are created through him and in him. And therefore, we begin to understand the fundamentals of what Christian anthropology is all about. And I would like to lead you to focus on some of these uh, requirements of that growth that is uh, in terms of a proper understanding of Christian anthropology. On the first aspect, we have what we can refer to as the natural, the cataphesis, and the cataphesis indicating as man being created uh, in the image and likeness of God and given the virtues, given the charities and being uh, in faith and the image of God, it is uh, the, the mind of Christ, the thoughts, the will, and the ability to choose and desire to love. This is our destiny and our call. It connects man with God. God's image is bonded with man's being. His likeness is connected with all the modes of his being. In Ephesians 4.13, 4, we read, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is what cataphesis the natural as created by God. Then we come to the second stage of what is regarded from the understanding of the scriptures, especially from the book of Genesis, what we can refer to as paraphesis, which is the state of fallenness, man nature as evil with thoughts, sinfulness, corrupting it, but not total 
corruptibility. In this stage, we understand that it is the freedom and the state that the need for spiritual growth. Man is divine by grace, intelligent is to desire God, will to go with God's plan, memory to remembrance of God, and reflect on him. Spiritual life increases human energies and to acquire theosis. This is the kind of things that man seeks after having experienced the state of fallenness. And this is where the prophets of the Old Testament comes to tell the vineyard of our Lord, the Jewish nation, thus says the Lord. And this is what is given by reminding ourselves about the calling that what the God calls us into that state of recovering and reflecting on him and maintaining that spiritual life in terms of cooperating with that uh, energies and that are given by the grace of God. The third stage comes as re referred to as hyperphesis and that is man as deified the imitation of christ nature and grace maintaining a state of uh, synergy we talk in this regard about the diseases of the inner heart and that is the state of sin that obstructs this natural growth towards the divine a deviation forgetfulness, ignoring God, self-love, the desire to live separate from God, and overcome by passion and desires of anger, grudges, struggle, love of control, man has fallen, and the other vices that we find, whether it is the gluttony or sexual desire, love for money, greed, sadness, anger, fear, pride, arrogance and corruption and ultimately death. These are devices that we can re refer to that in other presentation concerning the situation that the deification of man, the nature that responds with grace will fight all these elements and give us the idea of the healing and the restoration. Man, which who inherited that sinfulness, not personal sins, affecting nature. We look into hunger, thirst, labor, pain. Christ becomes the healer, and we have the sacraments of the church, baptism, synergy of man's energy with the divine grace, sacraments of the church, maintaining virtues, and Christ becomes our model. It is not what the world produces, it is Christ that becomes the model. And as a result of that, we have the conclusion of this, you know, these three stages. Man is deified, man's aim to raise nature above its own level, to offer back to God in a Eucharistic notion of love. Man is capable of manifesting God to a, the extent which his nature allows itself to be transformed by deifying grace. The salvific work of Christ is intended to purify the soul from all passions, bringing the new man who is created in the absolute image of Christ. A healthy person in this regard becomes a spiritually balanced person developing true communion with God. These are the stages that we understand in terms of the healing of the soul, in terms of the three stages that we find from the fall from the creation, which is good, nothing that God creates is bad or evil, and it is the stage that we need to achieve in terms of uh, facing the state of sinfulness, but it is not total corruptibility. The human person has the freedom to go beyond that and to become 
uh, in a process of healing to be deified and to be restored in the image and likeness of God. So this is what we can refer to as being the holistic approach of the human person. Whereas we see the Platonist approach to the human person as contrasted with our understanding what we find in Plato between the soul and body, the intellect and matter, and the, the matter being nothing but a tomb or a prison of the intellect or the soul. The true person, according to that understanding, that it is the intellect, the mind is eternal, immortal, exists before the body and will survive it. And that's why, you know, we see it in some uh, other philosophical circles, especially in some of the Greek uh, understanding, like, like the Pythagoreans, and what we find in the philosophy of the East, the notion of the reincarnation, that the body is incidental and, uh, you know, must uh, go from one stage to another until it becomes purified in a body, but goes through many different bodies, whether it is human beings or even animals. Also, the second understanding is the biblical understanding, which is the Christian, the composite of body, soul, and spirit, where a human person would say, I am in my body. I am not separate from my body. The body becomes an essential aspect of the total person. And it is because our understanding of the incarnation as becoming the foundation of all truth concerning the human person. In this regard, we are reminded in the philosophy and in the theology of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who attacked the heresy of the Docetists, who said that Christ did not uh, you know, uh, become incarnate. He just simply appeared that Jesus Christ, as we understand in uh, our Orthodox theology, in the incarnation, he took human body. He was seen, he was touched, and he, were, he ate with man, and people talked to him, and he talked to them. Salvation becomes visible, born. Jesus Christ was born physically of a woman. He lived on earth. He experienced hunger and thirst, the, and, and he was transfigured in physical body. He suffered death and resurrection and ascended in that glorious body, and physically, he will appear again. So the human person was saved when he took body, soul, and spirit, saved the total personhood. In the words of St. Paul, body is a living sanctuary, as we read in Galatians, temple of the Holy Spirit, as we read in Corinthians. And that is the reason that we have to understand how to deal in our theology a proper notion of understanding of who Jesus Christ is. In the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 13, we hear Jesus Christ as being yesterday, today, and forever. Human history is divided between that which is before Christ and what is after Christ's incarnation. Christ remains the greatest inspiration to those who love him and the consolation to humanity. It is either life with him or death without him. He is the son of God who became man for our salvation. Faith in him is unchanging and transcends our rational understanding. Our confession of faith lives in the church by the grace of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it was given as a type and is now fulfilled completely in the New Testament. This is what we refer to as the typology, not something that is done in figures or symbols. The New Testament, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is the incarnate Logos who came to the world to redeem creation from the corruption of sin. 
the revelation of the Son of God and the understanding of God man relationship is a folly to Greek philosophy. We will read that Sunday you know, on the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross in 1 Corinthians 1.23. Greek philosophy established as a course of rational and methodological type of knowledge. Greek philosophers were interested in how things came to be and how to define the essence of things. Certain qualities were needed to develop despite their high education and rich cultural wealth and intelligence. These church fathers, such as St. Basil the Great, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Gregory the Theologian, and St. Maximus the Confessor, were given a sharp mind and an enlightened heart. They were sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. They warned us from extremism and fanaticism. They did not allow reason to control the condition of the sanctification. They pointed out that intuition is above rational application of categories of mind. The proclamation of the word transcended scientific research and academia. Today we see a phenomenon in the West where theology is treated like any other science regardless of the content of faith and those who seek it. As a result of that, the emphasis is not on life but on religious education. So we have to be aware of certain issues. One, maintaining a balance between scientific life and church life. Secondly, spiritual life cannot be pursued separately from culture. Three, balance is to be established between science and life in Christ. Number four, the pastoral aspect is vital as a way to deal with all aspects of life so we can reach the fullness of the stature of Christ. Knowledge is a means that helps us live in Christ with understanding and with purity. Number six, the universality of the church, the universality of the church is expressed in the local community and transcends the same. There is an issue to deal with, such as a heresy. We go beyond jurisdiction and boundaries. Number seven, the church is made of clergy and laity together. We should not make the church on our own standard, but must raise all of us to her standard. Number eight, church fathers were organically connected with the church. They were not employees, but fully dedicated to Christ at all time. Number nine, Christian life is all rounded life. It is not enough to reach and preach and write books. We must be concerned about the poor, the sick, and the strangers, but we also have to maintain what is given to us in our own life and in the church fathers as being challenges given to us for our own age. Which means that in order to come to the understanding today, we have to look into this differentiation and distinction between rational approach and the spiritual approach, we have, we don't have to deal with it and understand it as philosophers or researchers or even theologians, but to understand it from the pastoral perspective. In, the, in all theology, if it is not rooted in pastoral experience, it becomes dead and empty words and slogans that will not lead us 
to what is considered as a stage of maintaining holiness and sanctification. This is the call of the Christian is to maintain salvation through that path of deification. The church has many saints known as fathers. Those are the people that can bring up people in Christ. They are our fathers and mothers, the saints who have fulfilled the condition of sainthood, who have been united with God and have become the habitation of the Holy Spirit. They become our teachers. Most of the Holy Church Fathers acquired high education and secular knowledge, such as law, philosophy, rhetoric, and logic, while they lived in harmony with God. They combined secular knowledge with spiritual knowledge, that is, life with the Lord. They become vehicles of the Spirit. They were able to combine the proclamation of the gospel in the language of their age. They addressed human beings with the language of their children so they may be able to be understood. They are labeled as spiritual fathers for they obtained life and counseled others and brought them to live a life of purity and enlightenment. Their counseling focused on life in Christ but the Holy Fathers, we have to understand, are not the Holy Spirit. The nature of things, plants, flowers, human beings, the need to have nutrition, oxygen, sleep, pain, sadness. Christ as God, man, was an enigma. And as a result of that, there developed two currents of those. You have in the history of the church, either the rejection of the divinity at the expense of being satisfied with humanity or ignoring the human element and being sufficient with the divinity. In other words, we have what we know in the history of the church as Arianism and Nestorianism as two radical extremes. In the first case, scenario we see Jesus as essentially a human being, an individual person with special gifts, respectful, a normal teacher, a social reformer, or an important person, or who has the ability to lead humanity to a great accomplishments. On the second case, we see that Jesus Christ enters the human history as divine. He appeared as man in the form of man as the desotus thought, a shadow. However, in essence, he is not human by nature. This approach brings to the understanding of a human history, a philosophical and moral dualism. The intention is to protect divinity from physical corruption establishing a dualism between the divine and the human spiritual reality and materiality between temporality and eternity and between the sacred and the profane. To explain further, the absolute human trend will empty the person of Jesus Christ from divinity. He becomes a normal, discipline defined by rules and regulations, while absolute divinity will bring defilement and traces the corruption to the material world. Eros or love will be reduced to a passion of sexual desire and the loss of true meaning of personhood. Both approaches will stand in opposition to the notion of salvation that is given to man by Jesus Christ, who is truly human and divine. This division and confusion in the heretical understanding of the divine person of Jesus Christ has led many theologians to some heretical conclusions. In this regard, 
the work of the Holy Spirit in the church is defined by individual efforts and will be falling astray because of the alienation and because of sin. It deprives the church, its true image, as one body, a collective one, united, gathering with one mind and in one flesh, in one faith, and the same moral cause. The gospel becomes subject to individual interpretation that will reflect moods and mentalities of people and is not the result of pursuit of the life of holiness. In addition, literary criticism and scientific method will make the divine person words subject to rational standards and no longer will allow the response of the human heart to the divine call. The new creation loses its life and meaning and becomes a human mode, relative and subject to change and skepticism. In fact, spirituality will be reduced to some emotional and personal interpretations. The church becomes reduced to a sociological entity, not the body of Christ, the Soma to Christu, even salvation becomes relativistic. This entire confusion, full of symbolism and diversities of interpretation, will reduce Christ to a culture or a phase of history from the past, and the work of the Holy Spirit will be a past event. Marriage becomes a legal institution and even salvation of man becomes confusing. We bury ourselves in the past and lose this sense of anticipation as sheer decad decadence. How can the church avoid falling into this confusion? By acknowledging in Jesus Christ as fully divine and human, perfect divine and human in the heart of the creation. To live in God and by God, to acquire the gift of the Holy Spirit, Christ becoming all in all, in the entire composite of the human person. We look into the three levels that call us from purification to illumination and ultimately to sanctification. And the role of the church is to reach to a genuine knowledge of Jesus Christ. This message of the church is the sanctification of the world, starting with the human person and faithfulness to Jesus Christ, bringing him to the world itself. It is the attempt to present the world and fully dedicate it to Christ, not just a simple part of it. The church fathers were aware of the wholesome ministry of the diaconia and the kinonia of the church life in all its details. So therefore, it is not enough to teach people by words. In the long run, it is teaching by action and by example. Do we have any time to continue or shall we stop and ask, uh, see if there is any questions? There are 10 minutes left, Father Joseph. Uh, it's up to you. I, uh, I think maybe we should use the last 10 minutes uh, for questions, but it's up to you. I would be also uh, happy to uh, draw some, some conclusions that might be uh, important uh, based on the, 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 the teaching that, uh, you know, as we've repeated uh, so many times, we can have some of the uh, conclusions that could be a way to, to remember uh, some of the things that uh, we need to, to understand from uh, following, uh, you know, this the presentation that we made that, uh, um, you know, in the, in the uh, future, maybe we can talk about, uh, you know, the idea of how, uh, you know, we maintain that, uh, you know, if, if you read the, in the writings of uh, Metropolitan Vlachos, you will have uh, this idea of the conditions and the characteristics of the sickness of the, uh, you know, soul and how we, we get to that and how we can increase our state of, uh, 
knowledge into uh, maintaining that healing and what we do in order to do that. And uh, we, we, we look into it, not uh, in the idea of, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, methodology or a structure that we get it from a philosophic approach of uh, the Stoic or uh, Plato and uh, the, can, the kind of things that we find in Neoplatonism in the state of dispassion and ecstasy. Man uh, must be interpreted as Christ-centric. He does not refer his life to himself, but to God, not to autonomy, but to theonomy. That man is created in the image and likeness of God. In this regard, we can you know, focus on uh, the book by Metropolitan Vlachos, The Illness and Care of the Soul in Orthodox Theology. We understand the proper psychology is proper theology engaged in the therapy of passions. It is a location of the illness that is necessary locating it as we read in Matthew 23, when we hear the words blind Pharisees, clean first that which is within the cup and the platter, not the outside them that may be clean also. We have to maintain both, that in the long run, a healthy man is a spiritually balanced man in all his or her manifestation and develop a true communion with God. So uh, in the future, we, we can also focus on some of these aspects that uh, we, we know about what is known the seven deadly sins that will uh, enable us to uh, see how the illness of the soul is maintained and at the same time how we can uh, you know get into the process of healing in the conclusion the presentation itself is not calling the inhabitants of the places in the world to vacate and desert their homes and leave. This presentation is giving us the opportunity to us to consider repentance as being uh, uh, not repentance from beauty, but from the admiration of beauty. Repentance is not from the possession of money, but from the worship of money. The fruits of repentance is chastity, respect, benevolence and meekness and charity. Sin in the world is identified as a need in the flesh, an irresistible seduction, a suggestion, a psychological incident. What we experience today and what we really threatens our existence and sanctity is not falling in sin, the confusion of mixing between good and evil. What attracts us in Christianity is not the theology, but the sanctity, theology leading to purity of heart, worship and liturgy, supporting our journey in righteousness, praying, counseling, and organizing to deify us. In the long run, it is what we do not hate the sinner, but we hate the sin. And that is what the Christian life is all about. The obsession of Christianity is to prove to its members and the world that God can inhabit the human heart, transform man to shine with splendor. The saints extinguished passion into charisma and restored the sweetness of living, the meekness, the transparency, and self-sacrificing for others, a total abolishment of worldly glory. Beauty of the universe is based on the magnificence of knowledge, but those whom God has carved by his finger and planted them in this world of our misery witness to him. They are baptized by tears. They love Jesus in his nakedness and they obtain his crucifixion then as their sincerity 
and of their daily meekness. This is the challenges. This is the way that we see as a result of the presentation that we have given in this particular teaching. And we hope that it will enable you to understand both uh, doctrine one and two, especially doctrine one, because doctrine two deals specifically with the uh, theology and the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. But again, it will be also able to understand that we do not understand the Holy Trinity as something philosophical or something that is part of the categories of our mind. If we lead into that, then we will see ourselves moving into some intellectual knowledge or a God that is not incarnate in our life and becomes an example and a way to, to follow in terms of our being uh, in Christ and by Christ and for Christ, we fulfill that goal and that aspiration of our human life and human existence. Any questions? Father, I have one. Uh, this is David Potts. Um, somewhere along the way, you mentioned we should have our thoughts on only four things. I remember that one of them was death, but I don't remember what the others were. If if that the things may. that I mentioned that we have to remember always constantly the remembrance of God, the, the goodness of God that we are created in God's image and likeness, the remembrance of the state that God, God, God called us, you know, to share uh, by, by being uh, in a state of uh, energy and synergy with, with, with God. And at the same time, remembering that uh, we have, uh, we are not... Uh, infinite human beings we are finite we are have a beginning and we have uh, a physical end and we 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 always say as we repeat in our prayers we ask and see a christian ending of our life and these are the challenges that are given to us all the things that we encounter in this life in terms of these challenges must have a sense of a proper response and these are some of the things that we need to do in terms of our prayers. We, we do not, God does not uh, need us, uh, you know, to hear our uh, prayers. He knows our needs and he knows what, he, what we want, but uh, it is through prayers that we seek to understand and learn his will for us. And this is what is important when we, we hear, uh, you know, the words of our Lord when he encountered that man with epilepsy and uh, his father came to him, he says, I have my son, I gave him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And the Lord uh, afterwards uh, was asked by his disciples, how come we could not do it? He says, you don't have faith. You, you, you have faith as little as a mustard seed, you are able to, uh, you know, to move mountains. But uh, you need that because uh, to, to control and to uh, defeat the devil, you need the prayers and you need fasting. You need fasting, not in terms of uh, an outward experience, but fasting in terms of the total personality, in terms of uh, having fasting uh, of the mouth, of the ears, of the, uh, of the eyes, of the legs and of the foot. Everything that we do and move must ultimately be a way that leads us in. Because our calling is not to feed our mind into knowledge and reading books and materials and so forth, but lead a life of uh, sanctification and holiness that ultimately pertains to our salvation. This is exactly what makes us different other than different, uh, you know, uh, faith that we find in the world that gives us uh, prescriptions of things that we need to do and and as you do from one to five that means you are you are saved but that is not what salvation is all about in our own life in the understanding of the church it is what we do in terms of salvation by focusing on the others on those who are uh, with us and those with whom uh, we, we we are saved together and the only thing that uh, we, we we avoid is not a recommendation or prescription.
questions that we do it as a lip service, but as a way of life. In the long run, this is what Christianity is all about. And this is uh, what uh, makes uh, Christianity as a specific way of life. Unlike what we find in philosophy, it could be something uh, very high, very expensive and important and uh, challenging. But then uh, in the long run, you will have a multiplicity of all these means. What Plato says and Aristotle and the Stoics and the new uh, Neoplatonists or other philosophers uh, from those who were idealists and those who were realists and those who were uh, even in the philosophy of existentialism, each one will give you a certain way and a certain things, a certain method or a certain uh, type of understanding. And it is not just one. Ours is based like Christocentric that enables us to uh, to be what Christ is and our model again is the incarnate our Lord Jesus Christ we do not uh, look into our own philosophies or in our own ways of uh, you know thinking of things mostly we look into our model our uh, you know the imitation of Christ as a way of life that ultimately leads us to that the salvation. Thank you, Father. I, I had one just other question if you had the time for it. Okay. Um, so I know you spent most of your time talking about these things, but they're, they're somewhat new to me. Um, you know, learning the different kind of, you know, I guess parts of our being, you know, the mind and the noose and these things. So I don't have all that down quite yet, but on a very basic level, um, you know, the rational mind and, you know, um, our spirits. Is it basically that our, our spirits are supposed to become kind of the primary function over our intellect? It's not that we completely, you know, disregard thinking, but it's that kind of our, um, I guess, uh, yeah, that, that the soul becomes the primary function. Is that okay. right? I, I would say the, the reason I, I gave uh, the, the beginning, uh, in the beginning I gave this uh, understanding uh, what comes from philosophical backgrounds and philosophical thinking, that there are those who focus on the material world, on the body, and that those who uh, look into uh, more being more realistic, such as uh, Aristotle, the, he is the father of uh, realism, and you have uh, the focus on, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, on Plato, where the body becomes transient, where the body becomes evil, prison of the soul. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, this was, you know, given in these two uh, heresies that we find in Arianism and uh, Nestorianism, you know, as uh, regarded heretical by the church. On one was the divinity absorbing humanity of Christ. And then on the other hand, in areas you have the humanity of Christ as being, uh, you know, that there was a time he did not. He was, uh, you know, brought as one, a higher creature, but still a creature. The human, uh, you know, understanding of the human person in Christianity is the composite of body, soul, and mind. We're talking about three aspects. When we talk about uh, the sense of deification, it involves our entire being. The body is not something to be ignored. We mentioned about the things that we do in the church concerning how to touch the body. From the time a, ch a child is entered into the church through the uh, service of churching, through baptism, through chrismation, Holy Communion, the, the, the material world becomes important. We use water, we use oil, we use wine, we use bread, we use uh, palms, we use fruits, we use the material world that is created by God as being good. And the human person has the spirit of God and he created, is created by God as soul and body like other creature but i mean and there we have the spirit of god that enables us to move and uh, to be who we are we maintain all these three aspects 
as the human person being the composite of all these three elements and we cherish them. We understand the intellectual part that God gave us the, the mind, but that mind, if it is fallen, it will lead us into a state of fallenness as it is in the state that we refer to these stages you know, from the time of the natural, natural uh, level to the state of uh, being uh, uh, in a state of sin, to being restored, and that beyond that uh, nature, nature. When we, when we partake the, uh, the water, the holy water in the church, or we refer to the holy oil and all that, we are still maintaining the chemical qualities of that water, but we are reminded of the water as created by God in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, before the sin entered into the world. And the prayers that we do on the water is to bless the water so that it can be blessed, holy water as was created by God from the time of creation. The chemicals that of the oil, of the bread, of the wine and all these elements are maintained the same. We do not, uh, you know, want to change except to restore that which is unnatural because of sin to that natural state as created by God. And therefore, uh, whether it is the ability to be logical, to have uh, the mind and to maintain the mind of Christ in what we do becomes important because the mind has to lead the human person through the heart and the heart through the body to maintain that sense of harmony between these three elements. And this is uh, our calling. And that is why when, when uh, we, we, we read in the, uh, uh, in the writings of St. Gregory Palamas that debate during the 14th century between uh, him and the, the Bar Barlaam and also all those uh, you know, from uh, Thomas Aquinas and the others when they talked about the uh, eternal energies of God and the, the fact that uh, the knowledge of God is possible uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the human mind and so forth. The theology of uh, St. Gregory Palamas was to indicate that the, the, the energies are eternal and they are divine. They are the ones that teach us and lead us and uh, are uh, in a state of synergy with the human person that even the human body, once it is restored through all the sacramental life of the church, that is given the opportunity even to transcend the experience of death, that we are not just a And we cherish even after death by, by uh, you know, prayers that we offer, by the way that we visit our loved ones, by the prayers that we offer in terms of the nine day or three day or 40 day memorial services, or uh, that we have a special honor of the body. Why? Because of the incarnation that Christ transfigured in the body, Christ ascended in the body and the body becomes, uh, you know, sharing in that glory that is given when Jesus Christ is on the right hand side of the Father. He is with his glorious body, the body that he assumed from the Virgin Mary, which is ours. And that is what is important in terms of the dignity and the value of the human person. Thank you. Brother, thank you so much, uh, and thank you, David. Uh, we, I, I'm sorry, but I have to move on, so we need to end the meeting here. For those of you who still have questions, join us on Friday. Father Joseph, thank you so much. Okay. A uh, beautiful session, uh, uh, and uh, we will see you on Friday at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, we will start with Doctrine 1, and then we will move into Doctrine 2. Perfect. Thank you, Abu And if you have any questions, then... On this uh, presentation, you may do that. Thank you. Thank and Abuna, I need the list of the students, please. It's coming. You know, you it's coming. I, I will have it for you this week. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you, uh, hear you, and uh, talk to you Friday. All right, goodbye, everybody. Okay. Thank okay. you.